It's so so it's funny because I think it's just delayed because when you walked away like three minutes later, it showed me like so so it's funny because I think it's just funny because I think it's based on the chip in there. So
everyone for coming out. Good to see everyone. I'm uh, Eric Ottero. I'm with Pure Software. We got a chance to see a little most of you before we got started. Um, this is the Ansible Nova users group. Well aware we just overtook Silicon Valley as uh, one of the top 20 largest user groups in the United States. So well done. Thanks for joining. Thanks for continuing. Got our eyes on uh, Raleigh. I think is our uh, next one to take down. Uh, uh, Peter Software is a uh, solution provider for value-added reseller. Um, we focus on enterprise open-source technologies. So Ansible is really right inside our wheelhouse. Uh, we like to do these sorts of activities for the community users and uh, just get everyone together. Um, because many of the things that you're working on are very similar, and it's okay to get some you know, cross exchanges going. Um, Ivan is here from Endosis. Uh, Ivan, and, uh, I should say, Endosis and Fierce have a very strong relationship um, in providing open source solutions. And um, he's going to be presenting on, it's a little risque, but uh, last, last meeting, there was a, a lively debate. Puppet, Ansible, Chef, Solve stat. Are the, what? When is one good? When is not? Um, and we are kind of coming at it from a perspective that it doesn't need to be a versus in between these. It can be an and. And you know, a robust open source solution can incorporate many of these different tools. Ivan's going to be going through that. He's got kind of a meta presentation um, where he'll be going through certain use cases. He's going to demonstrate a use case where. Puppet and Ansible can effectively be used together. Um, it's not demonstrating, it's <laughs> showing. Not today. Uh, okay, that'll be the uh, that'll be the lion's share of this evening's uh, presentations. We have a little bit of a halftime, grab another beer, grab some more pizza. Uh, we've got Kyle Benson in the back of the room. It's, uh, Kyle's with Red Hat, uh, representing the uh, Ansible product. And Kyle's going to walk us through the 2.1 update. So containers, 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 containers. Windows. Uh, Windows, 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 Windows after that. So that'll be the last part. Um, feel free. Uh, I'm sure Ivan will take breaks here and there for some Q&A. You know, throw a hand up. Um, no questions. One no yeah. questions. If you are looking for a trial after this, uh, Fierce can cut those for you. Get a card from me. Uh, happy to help you. Cool. Thanks for coming out, guys. Really appreciate it. Uh, Ivan, take it away. All right. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for showing up. Thank you for listening. Thanks for eating the pizza.
pizza and drinking a beer and reading letters. No. Um, what I've got here today is, uh, as Eric mentioned, a meta presentation. What I've done is I've gone out and I've found use cases uh, where folks have used Ansible, use cases where folks have used Puppet and described their uses in different conferences and presentations, and I'm going to be going through and describing those. Um, and I'm also going to be giving you guys lots of references and links where you guys can go out and do some more uh, research, in-depth research, on why these use cases were useful, what the benefits are of using one tool or the other tool, and things of that nature. So uh, you'll be posting the slide deck, which is probably going to be the most beneficial portion of this for you guys to see. Ah. There we go. All right, so <sighs> managing IT operations is really complicated. We've got today all sorts of things. We've got clouds, software-defined networking, infrastructure as a service, software as a service. There's all that stuff, right? So one of the ways that we can make our lives much easier is by using automation. Now, this doesn't do away with our jobs as system administrators, but it makes it much easier for us not to have to do all the individual tasks, all the individual things, right? I don't know about you guys, but I can barely keep my phone number in my head. When I go to NARA or when I go anywhere and they ask me for my phone number, I have to think about that really hard. So remembering all the different details of everything that you have to do on a daily basis is nearly impossible. So these types of tools, this type of technology, is going to help us with that. So this is a summary of all sorts of interesting presentations. Um, here. The presentations that I'm going to discuss with you guys weren't done by Endosis, they weren't done by me. So we thank the original authors, and all the work that I'm going to be talking about is their work originally. All right, so who am I, and why are you guys listening? Well, because Eric invited me, I'm going to talk. But uh, I own and founded Endosis, which is an IT consulting and training company. I used to work for Red Hat. I've worked at AOL. I've worked at Fortune 500 companies. I've built data centers, built infrastructures. I've been doing this for about 20 years now, and so uh, this is a lot of fun for me. Uh, Our sponsors, Fierce is the one who sponsored this meetup, so uh, big kudos to Fierce. Uh, Endosis, that's my company, and Imix, which is the, the facility that we're using right here, so thanks to all the sponsors and some contact information for all those guys. And let me see here, so a bit of a history of the automation tools. So, those of you who have been doing this type of stuff are well aware of this. Automation tools uh, originally started out mostly with shells, yay, because human beings started using shells for money, right? And sysadmins decided to do the same thing. And then came along tools like CF Engine. CF Engine yeah, technically responds to a couple of commercial tools that existed before CF Engine. Opsware, and then they got bought by commercial providers and things like that. CF Engine was the first one that was really out there that did this type of functionality in any organized way. But who here uses CF Engine? Long live CF Engine. Although it's not dead yet. No, really. So today, there are four main tools that are used to provide this type of functionality. Right? There's Ansible, there's Puppet, Puppet being probably the most mature of all those tools. We have SaltStack and Chef. Chef is a fork of Puppet. The original authors uh, decided they didn't want to cooperate, so they split off. What we're going to start talking about is Ansible, because that's what this meetup is. It's all about Ansible. So there are, uh, what is Ansible? This slide deck right here is actually pretty fantastic and describes the real motivation as a system and as an IT operator as to why you would want to use Ansible. Essentially, like I said in the intro slide, keeping all of the stuff that's involved in running an IT data center can drive you crazy. How many folks here have had more than two or three cups of coffee today? Yeah, like everybody. Right? Is it natural to drink that much coffee during the day? Oh my God, no! That's crazy. That's insane. Right? So, um, a couple of notes about Ansible is that it's written in Python. It uses SSH for transport, so you don't have to install anything on the target systems, um, except for Windows systems, which are just bizarre here. Um, and uh, Ansible has been around for six years now, five or six years. And uh, it's purchased by Red Hat, who's actually accelerated the development of Ansible as well as making it a very useful tool for many enterprises. So 
the three Ansible presentations that I'm going to discuss briefly here are these three listed here. So Twitter, uh, Steve Salvan, uh, who used to work at Red Hat and who I know from his work at Tumblr, uh, went to go work for Twitter. And he talks a little bit about how they used Ansible. Um, this was a presentation that he did at Ansible Fest in 2014. So it is a couple of years out of date. But he talks about how Twitter used Ansible in order to reduce all of that coffee drinking that they had to do on a daily basis. Right. The next one is um, one from uh, Carlos Vicente that he gave at a conference called NANOG, which is the North American Network Operators Group presentation. And what they did was they looked at how software and IT developers were doing all this really cool continuous integration, continuous deployment, the CICD stuff that you've heard about. And they said, hey, we want to do that for our networking infrastructure, for our switches, for our routers, for our firewalls, for all our network devices. And so they built an infrastructure using Ansible and a couple of other tools to manage all their networking infrastructure that way. And this last one here is actually pretty fantastic. How many folks contribute software to open source uh, projects, GitHub and things of that nature? A couple of folks. But one of the things that you won't want to do is you want to make sure that you take any passwords, any SSH keys out of that software before you do your push and pull requests up to, uh, up to GitHub. Because Publishing that for the public is kind of embarrassing and usually very tedious to go back through and change all that stuff. So what Twitter did, um, the presentation is called How Twitter Uses Ansible. I added the for sanity because really it, it helped reduce a lot of their stress. And what they did was they, they had their own asset management infrastructure, asset management system called Spot, the single point of truth. So it was the one place where they had information about everything in their infrastructure. RAM, CPUs, uh, MAC addresses, um, uh, number of NICs for each of their uh, each of their devices, and they use this as their inventory, their inventory system. And they also use this for pulling out variables into their Ansible infrastructure. And then they built um, they built what was it called? Oh, they built. Cool. Top of that, that I can't remember what it's called. Servermate. Server yes, they built Servermate on top of that. So Servermate is the conceptualization of all these tools. So they put a database in the background where, after every Ansible run, they dump the output of the Ansible runs into a database so they could go through that and search that. This was before Ansible Tower was available. Now Ansible Tower is available. Ansible Tower does exactly that for you. So now you don't have to build your own server main infrastructure with your own database to keep track of your Ansible runs for you. You can use Ansible Tower for that. And um, unfortunately, there's no slide deck for this presentation, but there is a YouTube video where you can listen to Steve talk about all of this. And more or less at 2251 in the video is where you have a diagram of their infrastructure that he was talking about. I didn't have time to create a nice diagram because I flew up from Florida two hours before still finishing up the last set of slides. So then the second use case that um, I think is interesting here is the North American Network Operators Group use case, where they used NetCom, which was a protocol or management methodology developed by Juniper to manage networking infrastructure tools. So NetCom combined with Ansible and Jenkins for doing their push-pull requests and continuous integration along with GitHub for the actual configuration code where they check stuff in is how they were able to essentially stop or they were able to remove the need from them to log into servers and switches to update configurations. They used GitHub to keep the code, to keep the configurations in, and then they used Jenkins to see when new pushes and pull requests, and they developed an approval workflow, and they called this infrastructure Kipper. So basically, they looked at Everything the software guys were doing. They looked at everything that the IT ops guys were doing and said, yeah, we want to do something like that. And so uh, I listed the slide deck on the original page, and this is the YouTube video from that presentation. And then here's a diagram that came out of that slide deck that describes it. Right? So they have a local repo copy. They make their changes. They publish the pull request up into GitHub. That pull request goes into the Kipper server, which then pushes it out into a test infrastructure. That test either comes back and into a chat channel, which at the end of the Ansible I'll talk to you about, 
use a methodology called chat ops, which is really interesting. But back into the chat channel is where they get the results of whether or not that test passed or failed. If it passes, then an operator logs into the chat channel, approves that pull request. That goes back up into GitHub, we get a merge notify, we get a deploy, or I'm sorry, we get a tag release and then a deploy. Jenkins handles that portion of it. And back into the chat channel, we get the results of that production deploy. So they were able to implement essentially continuous integration, continuous deployment for their networking infrastructure. This isn't servers. This is an application. This is networking infrastructure. That's pretty good. And um, the third Ansible use case is the one where you're contributing code to upstream projects. But let's say perhaps you're not contributing code to upstream projects, but you are using a centralized repository in your data center. However, Everyone has access to the centralized repository, and the only thing you're supposed to be pushing up there is code. You don't want to be pushing passwords, because sometimes we have to hard code passwords into our configurations, or SSL keys, or SSH keys, or things of that nature, in order to make things work correctly. Well, if we don't want to push those things into the upstream, we can use Ansible Vault. And Ansible Tower is integrated very nicely with Ansible Vault. If you forget to take your SSH keys out of your code, and you do end up pushing it to the upstream open source projects, I think, I'm not sure if Dan coined that phrase in his presentation, but I, I thought that was a pretty apt one. Um, I've known a couple of developers that have done this. They've set the dev oops, accidentally pushing your secrets up into the wild. So uh, I don't have a diagram of how this works. So pass that slide. Other places where Ansible is actively being used. So OpenShift, Red Hat's OpenShift uses Ansible almost entirely. And, and um, our Red Hat expert, our, our Red Hat speaker, is going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, one of the guys that used to work for me, and uh, is a good friend of mine, he now works on the Red Hat OpenShift team. He uses Ansible quite a bit on the Red Hat OpenShift team. He's done lots of <coughs> work in the past. He's done, he's contributed code to SaltStack, and he absolutely loves Ansible. Ansible is, is a fantastic tool. Other places, OpenStack. OpenStack is a cloud infrastructure project. How many folks have private clouds in their data center or manage private clouds? Really? Somebody's using public clouds? That's amazing. Amazon's making lots of money. <laughs> All right, well, if you're ever going to run a private cloud, OpenStack is the easiest way to do that. And OpenStack uses a lot of Ansible in their own infrastructure to do code commits, to do code changes, and even to manage the OpenStack infrastructure itself for hosting all the OpenStack tools. Vagrant has provisioners, which tie in really nicely with Ansible. There's Jenkins plugins for Ansible, and ChatOps. This is a, a fantastic um, idea right here. ChatOps is, the, is a step further from what the North American Network Operators guys do. Right? So they get results of their Ansible runs and their code deployments in their chat channels, Slack, Instant Messenger, whatever it is that you're using. ChatOps takes a, a step further and says, you know what, from the chat channel, we'll be able to do actions instead of just giving results back. Um, uh, Stackstorm is a, I'm not sure if it's a project, I think it's a company that was formed to integrate tools like Ansible into chat messaging platforms, uh, such as Slack and things of that nature. Um, there's an open source version of that, and you can get that integrated. Um, as a matter of fact, their presentation right here is pretty fantastic in terms of how to get all those things work uh, in, in an integration type of environment. So right from your, your uh, Slack client on your cell phone, you can get notifications that things aren't working and execute Ansible Playbook runs in order to correct those things. You don't even need to open a laptop in order to, to do these types of things, to manage your infrastructure, to scale your infrastructure. You need more web servers, you need more AWS instances, you do that for them. Ansible Tower, if you guys haven't used Ansible Tower, definitely talk with Eric at the end of this, give yourself a trial license to use Ansible Tower. It's a nice web UI, it gives you management um, information, it gives you the ability to do all sorts of interesting things. You can schedule jobs, so right now, if you are using the open source version of Ansible, there's no scheduler built into Ansible. 
executable is a YAML file, and then you execute the playbook. Okay, well, you can set up a cron job to run it on a regular basis, but what if I need to give the ability to run these playbooks to other teams? What if I want to share this with other groups in the infrastructure? What if I bring on a new guy? Now I have to copy my files over to him, or I've got to give him access to GitHub. Well, you can do all that stuff with Ansible Tower. So you've got access control. You don't need to do command line stuff anymore. So if you've got one guy that's writing all your playbooks, you can have operators. You can have customers that go through and they run their own playbook runs without having to edit their own playbook runs. You can do some really interesting stuff with Ansible Tower. It's also available as a virtual machine. Um, you can run it with Vagrant. You can run it with a whole bunch of different virtualization technologies. Callbacks, monitoring, REST API. You've got an infrastructure that you can be integrated with. All right, so this is a, an interesting presentation here that was done um, at the OpenStack Tokyo Summit. That was last year, I think that was last year. Yeah, the OpenStack Tokyo Summit, where they essentially got together two experts within the OpenStack project for each of the four different automation technologies, and they had them all discuss the merits and benefits of each of those automation technologies and why they chose those automation technologies. So if you're on the fence about what to choose, there are lots of discussions online. This is a good one that talk about why they chose one over the other. Right. Sometimes uh, the best tool is not the tool that you want to use. Sometimes the best tool is a different tool. I find Ansible to be extremely beneficial in almost every situation. But you know, if you've got Ruby developers who really, really want to do more Ruby development, Maybe you can go to Chef or Puppet. All right, so Puppet. Uh, a couple of notes about Puppet. Um, they just put out a white paper, which is kind of interesting. It's the State of DevOps report, and it talks about how system automation and IT automation has saved thousands and thousands of IT hours. IT automation has increased productivity of system administrators something like 88% over the last five years, and all sorts of crazy statistics in this State of DevOps report. Um, couple of notes about it. It's written in Ruby. It has a master and an agent process, although you can run it masterless. Um, and its authentication is HTTPS with two-way certificate verification as opposed to SSH. So if you know SSL and you know HTTPS well, then you'll be able to troubleshoot this. If you don't, then it doesn't know SSH. All right, so three use cases. Uh, with regards to Puppet, uh, in terms of uh, what we're going to talk about today, Nachos. Does everybody know what Nachos is? It used to be called NetSaint. It's a network monitoring tool. Right? It's for monitoring servers. You can monitor switches. You can monitor applications. You can monitor all sorts of things. It's um, it's a framework that's written in Perl. It's been around for a very long time. Perl and Nachos configurations. Can get it. Hardly complicated and tedious. So what these folks did, um, what uh, what Mike and his team did was they <coughs> puppet and they automated the configurations for being able to roll out new servers and automatically add them into their Nodges infrastructure as well as take them out when they decommission systems. How many times have uh, you had your uh, asset management folks decommission servers and they still show up? in the monitoring tools, and you're getting red alarms, and the boss is like, why is it red on the screen over there? When we want the customers in here, we can't show red. It's like, oh no, those are decom, we can ignore them. Why are we ignoring them? It's just automated so they get taken out when they're no longer there. So that's one of the things that they did. This is uh, an interesting concept here, uh, the brownfield environment. Does everybody here know what a brownfield environment is? Hey, a couple of guys, fantastic. I wasn't really too clear on what brownfield environments were, but I had kind of an idea. Brownfield environment is a place where you have to do upgrades and maintenance while the system is in use. So for example, if I need to demolish a building in the middle of the city, well, it's a brownfield land space. I can't demolish that building and say, okay, everybody get out of other buildings and blocks and out of the city. No, you have to do it while it's in place. Our IT data centers. Does anybody work in an IT data center that can just go completely offline to do maintenance upgrades? No, we all work in those, right? So this is a good a good talk that um, it talks mostly about automation, why automation is important, although it does touch on Puppet a little bit. 
And the last one here is about how to manage Puppet, uh, how to manage Postgres with Puppet. So managing Postgres, especially in a dynamic, in a large dynamic environment, can be kind of tedious. Setting up all of the extra databases, setting up the grants for who needs access to what, what applications are coming out. So uh, Chris Everest at a medical organization called Cover My Med talked about how they use Puppet to facilitate that. So let's see here. Uh, Mike, he goes into the not just configuration and clients, and he goes in through the configurations as well as setting up the monitoring of Puppet itself. So he uses Puppet templates to create configuration files for Nodjos to monitor the Puppet Master. That's magic, right? Uh, let's see here. So the biggest gain that they got from doing this was the ability to not have to change configuration, to build new configurations for their monitoring infrastructure anytime they add a new server. It automatically got added to the monitoring system. How many folks here use satellite server? or foreman, a few of you folks. All right, fantastic. So when you provision new systems, do you add them into the monitoring infrastructure automatically? Or do you have to create a new ticket and remember to go in there and add them to the monitoring infrastructure or get a phone call from a customer saying, hey, why is my system down? Well, it's not in the, oh, God, I forgot to put it in the monitoring system. Yeah, so we automate it. When we provision the system, we also put it into the monitoring system. It's already done. And same thing with removing decommissioned posts. More conceptual than it is practical in terms of specific Nodjos configuration. This one stays a little bit more conceptual in terms of what they describe. So in this presentation, he goes into things um, that talks about the justifications for why we need to use automation in our infrastructure. Um, and he goes into the concepts of what a brownfield infrastructure is. Um, he has some really good advice. Literally, start small. And it doesn't matter if you're starting with Ansible, it doesn't matter if you're starting with SolStack, Puppet, or any of those tools. The idea is to start small and don't try to build a perfect automation system. Build an automation system that gets you 80, 90% of the way there for whatever the small piece is that you're trying to automate. One of the things that you'll find is that no matter which automation system you use, if you start small, everyone else in the IT department is going to want to use that. Everyone's going to want to use that. Uh, when you get to the point where you're having to make a decision, okay, so this particular solution, puppets become unwieldy. Now I need to use something else because we can't, we don't have any more Ruby developers. They all left and got jobs at uh, Roku or Ruby on Rails or Rails or something like that. Well, then you can start taking a look at, okay, now we need to start looking at using one of the other tools. Iterate by incorporating feedback loops. Uh, you always want to go through a couple of times. The first time is not going to be perfect, no matter how you do it. This is my first time giving this presentation. <laughs> it's not going to be perfect. I'll probably give this presentation more than All right, focus on areas where the most errors are made and avoid trying to eliminate them all, right? So focus on whatever area it is where people always make mistakes, right? I have to copy in this massive command line every time I want to execute this thing. I need to update the web server. So now I have to type in this huge command line. I need provision assistance. So I have to type in a kickstart provisioning profile with a URL in it. Oh my god. You have to type in 200 characters. What are the chances you're going to mess up one character in a 200 character command line? They're actually pretty significant. As human beings, we're not very good at doing things exactly. And exactly over and over and over again. So focus on those types of things. All right. We're cruising, aren't we? I think we're a little bit ahead of the schedule now. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, the last um, specific presentation is the managing Postgres with Puppet. So this was an interesting one because this is a use case. Um, this is a real world use case. This company provides prescription drug services to lots of hospitals around the, uh, around the country. And it's a, interestingly enough, it's a subscription service that hospitals use to manage the medications that they're prescribing to their patients. So one of the things that they do is they provide a, 
Um, they call it a service-oriented architecture. So they have a lot of developers that are constantly spinning up new applications all the time. So they need to create new databases for each one of these. So doing that by hand is horribly tedious. So one of the things that they did was they used Puppet to develop modules to do this repeatedly, and quickly, and fast. Now, the uh, fascinating thing is that um, they actually shared the code that they used to manage their Postgres infrastructure on, on GitHub. So you can download this code if you have a large Postgres infrastructure you know, and need to manage that Postgres infrastructure and start using it. Managing prescriptions, man, that's, that's, that's kind of important. You don't want to get your prescriptions wrong. So by automating this infrastructure, they reduce the number of database errors, who was granted, who wasn't granted access to those, those databases for their, for their developers. All right, so other places where Puppet's in use, um, <coughs> very little secret. One of the things you'll notice is that Red Hat used a lot of Puppet before they bought into that. They used it in their tool quite a bit. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, Red Hat, or um, Puppet Labs has their own enterprise offering, and interestingly enough, on their website, they actually uh, showcase how you can use Puppet Enterprise with Red Hat Satellite Server <coughs> and with a lot of other Red Hat products. Um, so that's kind of an interesting cross promotion there. Red Hat Satellite 6 actually includes Puppet Master, and it installs Puppet agents on each of the systems that it manages in order to um, make sure that they're installed with all the right stuff. Red Hat Satellite 6 is based on Foreman, which is essentially a front end, which uses Puppet in the back end. There's the um, Red Hat Distributed OpenStack, or RTO, which uses Packstack as the installer application for uh, OpenStack. There is also, um, it used to be called Open, uh, OpenStack Ansible Deployment, yeah, triple O, director now. That's it. Yeah, so Python based. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and uh, big data tools. If any of you have big data infrastructures, uh, Apache's Big Top, which is a Hadoop stack, uses Puppet, Puppet uh, modules, manifests, in order to deploy a um, Hadoop infrastructure. And then there's also the OpenStack Fuel uh, deployment engine, which I heard a lot of noise about, I heard a lot of people talk about that last year, year and a half ago, but I haven't heard too much about it recently. That's still up. Um, so this is another different debate on the big four automation tools. This was held by the Sydney Salt Stack meetup group, and they basically had two, uh, four teams of two people, experts on each one of the different technologies, sit down and have a debate in front of the entire meetup. Um, Eric, maybe yes, sometime in the future we'll do something similar to that. An open debate panel of the different automation tools and technologies. I'm open for it. Any, uh, <laughs> any suggestions will be heard loud and clear on the meetup tool. Yeah, so this this was a fun, it's a fun video to watch. Um, they're very congenial, very lively. Um, it's a lot of fun to watch this. I'm sorry? Well, the conclusion is more or less this. Which one should you use? How about both? Depends. Use at least one. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the bottom line is, if you're not doing automation, you're doing all the work yourself. If you're doing all the work yourself, when are you going to get home to see your family? When are you going to get down to the golf course? When are you going to get to drink some beer and come out to meet up? Oh, wait, you guys are already here. Wait, who's doing the work? Who? Oh. Right? So, OpenStack um, actually uses both Ansible and Puppet, and um, a, I'm not sure how much SaltStack is in use at OpenStack right now, but I know that OpenStack has used SaltStack, OpenStack has used Chef. Uh, most of it right now, from what I understand, is either Puppet or Ansible in OpenStack. Um, there's an interesting article um, from a company called Botify, which has immutable images. So they spin up immutable virtual machines, and they have blue-green environments. They have a blue-green workflow. They can switch from one to the other, depending upon what it is that they've changed. Right? Once the systems are spun up, they don't change the state. That's what immutability uh, refers to in this particular case. And this is an interesting article that talks about the differences between Puppet and Ansible. And it's a very fair article that talks about the merits of both the different two technologies. Right. Um, 
what you will find if you go online is you'll find a lot of articles that are versus articles. They show you it's one camp arguing why one is better than the other and the other one should just go away. Or as the tweet storm and Twitterverse said, delete your account. <laughs> I didn't really get that at first, but I've heard maybe some podcasts that explain that very well. Right. The basic sounds of this, right? So no ops. Everyone here has heard of DevOps, yes? Anybody here heard of no ops? All right. No ops is kind of interesting. It's essentially just the new fun way of saying what we really mean when we say DevOps. It's not so much that developers are doing operations. It's that we're not doing the menial tasks of managing an IT infrastructure. If you want to be a system administrator today, doing all the small, tiny little detailed chores doesn't get you to building a large infrastructure. It keeps you busy making sure that this config file is updated, making sure that these packages are updated. That's not fun. I used to do that back in the early 90s. And that got really tedious back in the early 90s. It is 2016 today. We shouldn't be having to worry about these types of things, but we do. We do. We worry about these things a lot. So no ops, um, there's an interesting discussion about the term no ops. Uh, but what it means to me is instead of me doing all the tedious tasks, is I write a playbook, I use a framework, and I say, OK, framework. Make sure that my system looks like this. Make sure that my systems are doing this. Make sure that all the pieces in the infrastructure are configured the way I need them to be configured for my customers. Now I can worry about doing larger, big picture things that these frameworks can't do for me. I can worry about, OK, is this scalable? Is this going to be reliable? Rather than, am I worrying about, did I update the package? Oh, no, the Heartbleed vulnerability. Who wants to deal with that? Nobody wants so instead of having to deal with updating our systems and maintaining packages on our systems, let's focus on these types of things and use these frameworks. Because in the end, use automation to keep your sanity. Ansible is really easy to learn, really easy to implement. You don't need to install agents, which means you only need to install Ansible on one system in your infrastructure. And as long as you have SSH access to the rest of the system, you don't even need SSH root access to manage your systems. As long as you have sudo and SSH or something of that nature, Ansible is fantastic. This learning curve is actually probably the smallest learning curve out of all the automation tools. Puppet is very mature, which means it's been around for a very long time. <sighs> Admittedly, one of the things you won't hear too many red hat groups say, Ansible is uh, probably one of the younger automation tools, which means it's going to have some more slightly rough edges. So occasionally you'll run into a bug. Something doesn't work quite right. Now, 2.1 fixes a lot of those. So a lot of those things will be polished. But Puppet, if you have Ruby developers in-house, then yeah, maybe Puppet is, is kind of an interesting way to go. right? If you need to do lots of custom modules, if you need to do things that's not already provided by the framework, Ansible has something like 500 modules, so 500 different types of actions, managing clouds, managing packages, managing systems, that it can do. So it has a lot of those. Puppet also has a lot of those. I mean, it doesn't matter which one you use, but you should use one of them. Because in the end, um, you all know who, what Wired Magazine is, right? So Kevin Kelly is one of the founders of Wired Magazine. I listened to a podcast um, where he was interviewed just recently. And one of the fascinating things that he said in that podcast, and I'm paraphrasing it, but it's, I can't remember his exact words, is that once robots can do human jobs better than humans can, any humans that are still doing those jobs are effectively bad robots. Do you want to be a bad robot? Because I don't. So use an automation tool. Use an automation technology. And the Wired article is, is pretty fantastic here. Really, it's, it's talking about whether or not robots will end up taking our jobs. And the answer is no. There are a massive number of things that human beings still do way better than robots do. Figuring out new technologies like Twitter, figuring out how to make self-driving cars become self-driving cars. 
robots still can't do those types of things. Being creative, coming up with the crazy ideas, that's what humans do. So let's spend our time doing those types of things instead of being bad robots. All right. You guys have any questions? <laughs> yes, the answer is yes. We should use yes. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, contact information. Yeah, contact information is up here. Um, if you guys have any questions, you can contact me and contact Eric. Um, Ansible is a fantastic tool. Just recently, I got uh, one of the customers that I work at to start using Ansible to deploy <coughs> a very old technology called uh, IBM's typically management system, ITM. Oh my god, we tried to package that up as RPMs. And because the typically management suite uses its own thing called the deployment engine that creates customization of the files that are in the binaries at the time that it deploys them, we couldn't easily package it up as RPMs. So what I did was I took a guy who had no Ansible experience and almost no programming experience whatsoever. He knew how to write basic shell scripts. Um, young guy, too, um, late 20s, I think. And I said, look, use Ansible to do this. And in less than two weeks, he'd gone from zero Ansible to being able to deploy the entire ITM framework suite with an Ansible playbook. I helped him with some of the more complicated things in the Ansible playbook. But he did almost the entire thing on his own. He asked me some simple questions about Ansible syntax. Um, Red Hat just recently released the Ansible certification course. I and my team, we helped them write some of the lab exercises for that Ansible certification course. It was a lot of fun. Uh, before Red Hat bought Ansible, we were actually on the contract to write the course. But then Red Hat bought Ansible, and so they ended up taking over the course and writing the rest of the course themselves. They used a fair amount of our material. But we helped them write all the lab exercises. Course. That was a lot of fun. Ansible is fantastic technology. If you have Ruby developers and you end up using Puppet, hey, more power to you. Whatever you do, stop being a bad robot. All right. Thank you, John. All right, we're going to uh, do a little raffle here. Take a breather, get another slice of pizza, and then Kyle's going to take the stage and show us. Uh, notes on Ansible 2.1 release. Um, important thing that you kind of just mentioned uh, in passing, I've been the Ansible course from Red Hat is out. This has been out last week. Um, if you're looking for something like that, you'll find it on the website. Uh, here's will be up with a nice little check out. Okay. First thing we're going to do, one of these little fly copters. Fifty dollar value. Yeah. I got one. We're giving away a red hat just in time for summer. <laughs> red hat storage suites. It's a nice little jacket, though. I will not wear it. All right. You wear that in the data center where it's really cold. There you go. Zhang Shen, Amazon Web Services. All right.
I only have one.
Well, cool. So let's just jump into it. So last last month we released uh, Ansible 2.1. Uh, has anyone had a chance to look at the, the blog post we're on right now? Okay. Okay. So a few people. So for some of you guys, this will kind of be just a quick overview. Um, we don't have anything for demoing today. We just kind of wanted to run through some of the new features. This is kind of at the high, you know, the high level. Um, with this release, we focus really on primarily key uh, three or four things. So Ansible networking um, came out with some out of, kind of out of the box support for a lot of uh, networking vendors. Uh, Windows is now fully supported for a bunch of authentication mechanisms, or for all new Windows authentication mechanisms, as well as um, a few other ins and outs of what's available with Windows. And then you know over 100 new modules that a lot of them are based off of Azure, uh, kind of a rebase on some Docker modules, and then obviously there's more behind that. So uh, with Ansible networking, we did we tried to focus on these three things, right? So configuration management, uh, test-driven networking, and continuous compliance. You know, as Ivan mentioned a little bit ago, one of the use cases that we had, uh, not, sorry, I forget the full name of the networking organization, <laughs> was using Ansible to treat infrastructure as code, right? So being able to deploy that not just for someone who's dedicated to being a networking group, but for individuals or data centers that may be uh, run by you know, normal people, uh, this is a, a really key thing for a lot of people. So these are some of them. I know, you, I think you said you're from Arista, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so, so we have uh, you know, launch time vendor support for Arista, uh, uh, Cisco Systems, Cumulus, which is, um, yeah, um, we have a bunch of guys that work from Red Hat that actually work with Cumulus now. Uh, Hewlett Packard's Open Switch, and then Juniper Network OS. And so if you haven't checked it out yet, you go to docs.ansible.com, you can actually view all the four modules that are available for this online today. Um, so I definitely recommend taking a quick look at it. Um, they're really, really, excuse me, really, really in depth, and done, they've done some really good work around a lot of these uh, these tools. Um, Windows is now fully supported. As well, I guess I should say, as far as authentication. <laughs> and so, uh, when you start talking about you know, local users, uh, domain users, uh, Kerberos or Active Directory or NTLM, all those are now supported. So, if you have you know, WinRM set up and you're authenticating with your, uh, your Windows system. Um, pretty much every combination that you have of that is now enabled and fully supported uh, with Ansible and also with Ansible Tower, of course. Um, and then we just provided you know, support for managing file attributes, file sharing, and automated reboots. Um, another big one on the Microsoft side is we actually started providing some support for Azure. Um, so this is really exciting for us, maybe not so exciting for the gentleman from AWS. But, <laughs> but, but uh, yeah, so we, this is some basic support, right? So obviously Ansible has worked with Amazon and Google Cloud and just for uh, quite a while. This is a very, very early parlay to what you'll be able to manage and automate with uh, Azure. So, you know, kind of the basics, right? Virtual machines, virtual networks and interfaces, um, public IPs, uh, storage and security groups. No big surprises there, but it is a good starting point to start working with Amazon. You know, Red Hat works with all three of the kind of major uh, cloud providers, AWS, Google, and, and Azure. So it made sense that we would kind of contribute some place to keep that on a level playing field with our with our providers. So Docker, uh, Docker was refactored. I'm actually going to show you some stuff. We don't have slides on it today, unfortunately. We can kind of see a little bit about this in a minute. But uh, we refactored Docker support. And so these are the kind of three primary ones. You have uh, Docker container. Uh, Docker image backs and Docker service. So the Docker container is really all about managing the life cycle of that container. Is anyone use containers today actively? Well, well you guys are. So this is going to be really big, and the next thing I'm going to show you is kind of add on, add on top of this, but we spent a lot of time refocusing on Docker, um, specifically because if you can use Ansible to deploy Docker containers, it can be a really quick and easy way of deploying stuff. Um, those of you does anyone need a kind of quick overview on what Docker containers do? Would anyone like a quick overview? Okay, so um, <coughs> looking for the markers. We were actually here earlier today. This is the result of one of my coworkers using a permanent marker on an <laughs> impermanent space. Do you have one? Okay. All right. So, I mean, in, in a really simple sense, uh, is everyone here, I assume everyone here is using some degree of virtualization, is that right? Great. 
So um, when we start talking about Docker versus kind of traditional virtualization, the simplest way I can provide that is if you have, we'll say, you know, here's RHEL or some other Linux variant. Um, let's say hosting your hypervisor, you're going to use you know, RHEL. Great. You have the ability to install virtual machines on top of this, and obviously, as you all know, they can be of varying sizes. They can have different resources. You can manipulate and abstract where those resources to each of them. In that case, they have their own networking device or storage devices that are all emulated, right? So the nice thing about Docker containers is what you actually have is instead of having to worry about virtualizing those network devices, virtualizing those storage devices, is they actually use the underlying uh, devices provided by RHEL. So Docker manages and orchestrates that kind of back-end deployment so that when you spin up a container, it has its own internal IP address, but it's ultimately forwarded out to the, the, the address of this system. And so what that does for you is it makes, it makes it so that when you deploy a Docker container, you don't have to build up all the infrastructure. You don't have to install a full operating system. You can install the binaries uh, that are specific to your application and any dependencies for that application. So it's a lot less overhead than a traditional virtual machine. And I probably could have drawn out, you know, what we typically do is we'll draw out, you know, this is the, these are the infrastructure resources, and I'm sure no one can read that now that I'm doing this up here. But these are the infrastructure resources, so there's some degree of overhead here, but this can just be your code, right? So your binaries and your app logic, and all the stuff needed to run your application, and then you have the underlying OS take care of everything else. So um, the rate at which containers are spin up, we'll, we'll just call it kind of a 10 to 1, right? So for every 10 VMs you might spin up, you could potentially spin up 100 Docker uh, containers just on a, a really quick win. And so that can get really complicated over time. And a lot of people have started playing in the space to manage Docker containers. Uh, most notably was probably uh, Google. They created a thing called Kubernetes. And we actually use Docker and Kubernetes in OpenShift, which is our platform as a service offering. So all that to say, uh, in addition to offering it that way, we worked inside of Ansible to provide you know, increasing support for Docker, uh, where you can manage the life cycle of the, of the Docker container. You can also use Docker service to, to kind of manipulate that container and set preferences based off of what you need to do. And the middle one is just really about Docker facts. So um, this is coming this month, and we actually already made kind of one announcement around this. What you're going to see here is um, we announced a project about three days ago called Ansible, that Ansible Container, literally as you just saw right here, that will let you spin up containers from Ansible playbooks, no manipulation of the Docker tool line required. And not only can you do that, but if you if you run it in an empty directory, you know, if you run Ansible-container init, it'll create the necessary files for you to actually create that container without providing anything else. So that's going to be really cool for us. I mean. You know, we use Ansible right now to actually deploy OpenShift. Uh, it does a really good job uh, of doing that. It's obviously very verbose when you get errors. So um, being able to not only manage the infrastructure with Ansible, being able to manage the containers on top of that, we think is going to be really important. And you're going to start to see more and more of this as, uh, as you know, the year goes on, we, we continue to release new versions of Ansible. Um, so that was really kind of a quick overview. I was going to say, if you wanted to test out the Ansible container, tool set today. It is available publicly. It's on GitHub. Um, we have to build open source right now. So if you would like to test it out, kind of run with it. It's not too bad. Um, I'm, I tried installing it earlier today, I will say. I ran into an issue with the Python dependencies for FIP. So we'll see how that goes. I'll probably mess around with it a little bit later after this. But overall, it seems like a pretty good tool. And it seems like something that we're going to start incorporating into more of our products like OpenShift, like CloudWorks, so maybe even to deploy. Um, Docker containers and, and rapidly build those out. So that was, like I said, a really quick overview of what's available. Did anyone have any questions about what we talked about, just as far as what the components are available, what's new? Any playbook for being able to build the Ansible Docker? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't. I mean, so I was actually, I read about it the other day, and I actually just tried uh, installing it while you were speaking, and I was like, that'd be kind of cool to show off, and then you know, this, this is as far as I got right up here. So I said, okay, maybe maybe later. It's just that it looks like it's a permissions issue. I was like, that's news to me. But, so yeah, not yet. 
I can, I'll see if I can provide that as a nice and useful thing. Well, thanks, guys. Again, like I said, it was a really quick and short presentation. So if you have any questions, please feel free to see me afterwards. Everything is documented online right now, but um, if that's it, feel free to hang out, have some more beer, have some more pizza. I think there's still some left. And then uh, we'll see you next month. Yeah, <laughs> Okay. Let me check.